Good morning, everyone. Just nod your head if you guys can hear me. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I want to welcome everyone uh, and thank you for joining me on this uh, Sunday morning here, at least in the United States. I gave this talk on marketing and fee development and staff training and staff development at my local optometric society here in New Jersey. And it was about 60 people, maybe 100 people in attendance. And when I was speaking, it was like I was speaking Greek. They were looking at me, they were engaged, but really they weren't comprehending what I was talking about. Most of them dabble in myopia management. They feel compelled to do myopia management because there's so much out there on it, myopia management. Maybe their colleagues or the competition are doing it. So they come to my workshop for CE and they want to know how to grow their specialty care practice. But it went on deaf ears. So I approached the academy and I asked the academy um, to share these three uh, courses. Basically, the one course is on fee development, which I'm going to talk about next week. Uh, today is marketing. And then I finish off with a really strong lecture on how do you hire good staff to run your specialty care clinic and deliver the care I'm going to talk about today? How do you train them? And how do you keep them, you know, in this day and age? So that's how we're going to, we're going to finish this three-part series. So uh, I'm just going to ask Megan, who's the executive director. Megan, can you admit most people who are coming in now, or is that something that's up to me to admit? Nope, I'm getting them in. Okay, great. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about, for about 50 minutes, how do you market a specialty care practice? My name is Nick Despotitis, and I welcome you all. I've been in practice for over 30 years, 35 years, and a good chunk of that has been myopia management. And I'm a private practitioner. I don't have any conflict of interest. I don't work for any company. I'm a very happy practitioner uh, who's been doing this a long time and has no, has no plans on stopping. So, you know, let's, let's start by talking about marketing. This is Mario Andretti. Most of you know, very famous car driver, race car driver is now retired. But he has a great quote. Don't look at the wall. Your car goes where your eyes go. And in optometry, we have a lot of walls that I think dilute our focus. One of them, of course, is myopia management. The other one is vision therapy. A lot of us are trying to develop a dry eye clinic, a, a premier dry eye clinic. Other of us do scleral lenses and RGPs and specialty contact lenses. Some of us do low vision, others do glasses and soft contacts and medical optometry. Neural lens is another type of wall, if you will. And I think that, dis that kind of dilutes our focus. One of the key areas of marketing and growing your specialty practice is having one focus. So throughout my career, I've been very good at filtering out the noise. So what do I mean by noise? The, the, the big quote that my children use and now everybody uses FOMO is fear of missing out. And I really don't have any fear of missing out. If someone has a premier dry eye clinic or vision therapy clinic, and they're doing extremely well, I have no concern that it. I'm happy for them, but it doesn't influence my, de my decision within my office. I'm very focused. And I think that's the key to really successful specialty care. I have this joy of missing out. So when I hear presbyopia management and, and all the noise that goes in optometry, what I'm very good at is concentrating what I do best. What I do best is specialty care. We'll talk about fee development next week, and I'll tell you a little bit more of my practice, but we are a multidisciplinary practice. However, my focus within the practice is myopia management and seeing patients who pay privately to see me. So I'm a primary care doctor that doesn't accept any vision plans, that doesn't accept any health care plans. And I just do myopia management and service primary care patients. It's a nice place to be. And I think in our profession, as I read all these blogs and posts, is that 
people are starting to measure their self-worth, their, um, their degree of success on what other people are doing. So I love this quote by Kevin Kelly. He's written many books, but his most recent book is Excellent Vice for Living. Don't measure your success with someone else's ruler. It's so important that you knew, do that. Whether you have a small practice that makes you happy or multiple locations, 28 locations, that is just good for you, but it shouldn't influence your personal decision on how to run your practice. I run my practice a very certain way. I know the reason for me why I concentrate on myopia management. This is a picture of me with a patient. If you join my LinkedIn page, you'll see all these one minute interviews I do with my patients and my staff. It's because I really enjoy seeing children. So why did I decide to focus on myopia management? I think number one today, we could all agree it's standard of care. If you're dealing with a primary care population, it really is standard of care to educate parents that there are options to help stabilize a child's myopia. I also think it aided in my practice growth. We have six optometrists within our office and we share equally except two residents. So we have four partners share equally and then two residents. And there's, so there's six ODs in one very healthy, prosperous practice. And the reason we could do that is, of course, specialty care like primary care, excuse me, like myopia management. We've eliminated our dependence, our insurances and vision plans. And we've done this in a way that I'm going to explain in the coming slides. I have tremendous patient loyalty. Patients travel sometimes hours, sometimes four to five hours just to seek my care. And it's not because I fit them with a particular okay lens or I correct their myopia any better than the several hundred practitioners they're passing to come to my office. It's because of what I'm going to educate you on today. I have tremendous pro professional fulfillment. You could hear it in my voice, right? I've been doing this for almost 40 years. It's embarrassing to say in some sense, I can't believe it. But the reason I'm so energized is I do receive tremendous professional fulfillment from doing myopia management. And lastly, we're going to talk a little bit throughout this three-part series about what is most valuable to my life and what's most valuable to your life. It varies from practitioner to practitioner. But in order to be successful, I think in any part of life, you have to know what rings your bell, what stimulates your passion. And for me, it's respect. I always really enjoy when a practitioner tells me that they're enjoying and they've learned from me and they say, hello, Dr. D. That's a level of respect that I really appreciate and I work hard to earn. I also like to feel appreciated. I like autonomy. Autonomy means I love my independence. I don't work for any manufacturer. What you're getting here is purely my opinion of how to execute a very successful practice. So again, I enjoy my autonomy for the past 40 years, and I love uniquely helping patients. And it's not just through myopia management. So how does myopia management, the way I do it, differ from primary care? Well, my primary patients are children. In my practice, I only treat children as far as myopia management. I can fit adults with ortho-K lenses. I can correct hyperopia with ortho-K lenses, but I've narrowed my focus, and this is a key to success, to just pediatrics and myopic pediatrics. My primary care section is different. I see a general population, but as far as myopia management, I just examine kids. Another uh, difference between primary care and myopia management, I see the children often. So we see them every three months, sometimes sooner. So primary care practice, we may see them once a year, twice a year, three times at most. And I feel to be successful in any specialty practice, but especially myopia management, you need frequent communication in between visits. 
patients travel for my care. And the nice thing for at least for now, it's not covered by insurance. So when my practice grows, it's a healthy growth because a lot of us look at the gross revenue of our business, of our practice, or of our optometric practice, but that's a deceptive number. It may have worked in the past, but now having a higher gross revenue does not necessarily mean that you have increase in profitability. As a matter of fact, the inverse is true. Sometimes the busier you are, the less net or profitability you have because you have to hire more staff. You have to invest more in equipment. So we're going to talk a lot about that next week. I think there's some prerequisites. If you really want to grow your myopia management practice, you have to obviously enjoy working with children, which I do. Specialty care is very different than primary care. If you sec accept insurance or you, even if you have a high volume primary care practice, you don't, you just have to see these patients. They wait in your reception room, they get glasses, soft contacts, and leave. Specialty care is different. You're going to have to have separate systems to make the patient so incredibly happy with your care, they're going to refer friends and family. It really does require separate systems. So, you know, in the last series, the reason I left staff management and patient management for the end, it doesn't matter if you charge the right fees. It doesn't matter if you market well. What matters is if you know how to care for your staff and they care properly for your patients, you'll be unbelievably successful. And it doesn't work on volume. That's why I'm so happy is that I haven't been on this treadmill where I see hundreds of patients a week, thousands of patients a year, just to create a good living. With myopia management, if you market it like the way I'm going to describe, you don't have to work on volume. You work on quality patients. And the last thing is, if you get one thing out of this lecture, is if you squeeze your myopia management patients in, in between your normal schedule, like in between exams or pressure checks or RX checks or contact lens checks, you're going to fail. You're just going to dabble. And in my, in my opinion, you should just you refer those out because all you're going to do is frustrate yourself. Myopia management is similar to orthodontia. Once you get someone in your practice, you continually see them for sometimes years, even decades. So if you don't know how to do it properly and profitably, you still have these patients stuck with you for years. So marketing, the first key to success is to differentiate between marketing and advertising. People think they're the same, but they're really not. Advertising, which I don't recommend, is when you advertise, you pay for something, you go to the general public and you try to educate them on what myopia is, the myopia epidemic. So that could be search engine optimization. A lot of our websites, the, the people who host our websites say, hey, I can optimize your website, Dr. D. You, when someone says Google's, let's say, ortho K myopia, your website will come up one, two, or three. That's website optimization. It's a form of advertising. Uh, website, you know, to, making your website interactive and things like that. Social media is definitely a way to advertise. And the newest thing I hear about is funnel Facebook marketing, where we put an ad on Facebook or we don't, a, a great, uh, hopefully, person puts your information out there, teases someone on Facebook to get more information to fill out the form. Once they fill out the form, it funnels down to someone getting back to them. And then from there, it translates to an appointment to your office. So maybe from this Facebook ad, you may get, uh, I don't know, 30 people to respond. Of the 30, 10 fill out the form or respond to someone questioning why they filled out the form. And maybe you get three people into your office. So that's once funnel advertising or marketing. Why is it inefficient in my opinion? Well, when they call your office, even when they come in into your office, they're not qualified. They're not educated. They don't know what ortho K is or myopia management. They don't know the difference between eye drops and, and glasses. They want to know, does insurance cover it? Does it qualify for a flexible spending account? Is it safe? A good question is, is it permanent? You know, if I wear a lens, do, do I wear it for a few years and I stop? So what happens is our staff gets overwhelmed, especially if you funnel these 
calls and, and advertising works and your receptionist, he picks it up. And he's also asking patients to come in from the reception area, the doctor's calling on the other line, maybe. And the patient's asking all these questions. Basically, it's going to frustrate everyone. And it's just hard, hard work. So what I like to do is I like to market and there's several forms of marketing. So before the pandemic, I was very successful by lecturing at Chinese schools or any type of school that was interested in myopia management. There were certain demographics like swim clubs and, and things like that, parent clubs that I would lecture at and talk about the myopia epidemic. That has been really hard for me to regroup after the pandemic. So I've gotten very creative. And, and this is the level of focusing I have. It doesn't mean you have to have it, but it's the level of focusing I have. I've created these virtual uh, lectures that don't talk about myopia management first. It's what patients are interested in, like blue filtering, blue blocking glasses. A lot of patients have asked you, do they help with myopia management? Do they help? And whether you say yes or no, they're very interested in it. They bought these glasses usually on Amazon. They want to know if smartphone use has something to do with their child becoming more myopia or myopic or maybe iPad use. They want to know about screen time. They want to know about sleep. You know, sleep, is my child getting enough sleep? And, you know, they, they need to be educated. If I start hitting them on the head with myopia epidemic, there's a contact lens that helps slow it down. It's going to be inefficient. So what I've done is I've rented these uh, documentaries like Screenagers, where it talks about the emotional and mental side effects of children being on a screen. This is what parents are concerned about. This is a certain need of parents, and we'll talk about that in detail. So I give these seminars, and what you're looking at there is actually an outdoor seminar I gave, and that's a drone that has taken pictures of the people who have attended my workshops. And what I'm trying to do is get a buzz. The buzz is Dr. D's office, eye care professionals, our office is different. We also do virtual seminars. So here's my partner, Dr. Tannen, Noah Tannen, and he's interviewing a dentist, a good friend of ours. She actually leases space next door to us. And this is a career seminar. So what does this have to do with myopia management? In my opinion, it's the best form of marketing. You recommend a doctor you trust. So we get tremendous interest in us interviewing pharmacists, dentists, retinal specialists, internal medicine doctors, different careers. I used to do these in person, and now I do them virtually. I don't think they're as effective virtually, but there's still a way for me to differentiate my practice from others. The most innovative thing I've done post-pandemic is I've hosted seminars like I used to do at schools with patients. So here I'm hosting a seminar with Hannah on the upper right hand corner. The reason I think this is so innovative is I've taken a patient who wears ortho K lenses. She's about 14. She's listened to me for about five years to delay getting a cell phone because I feel the later she gets a cell phone, the more likely she is to be less obsessed with all the apps. And she's heard why and the algorithms. So I said, you know, to the parents, listen, I give lectures to parents. I'd like to do a public speaking seminar with Hannah. Hannah was up for it. And what we did is we did a one hour workshop, just like the one now on myopia management, but I don't start hitting them on the head with myopia manager. I start like I teach, let's, you know, do blue light glasses uh, work? Does, why does playing outside help with myopia management? Why does posture and, and, you know, things like that. And we also talk about Instagram and TikTok and YouTube. How do they hurt the eyes? Do they hurt the eyes? And so when this is done, I can use it for my patient population, but also she's going to transmit this to friends, family, uh, classmates, because her daughter is now lecturing and part of a lecture. So it helps everybody involved disseminating the information. So we're going to talk about influencers in a little bit. And after the seminars, we'll drip market uh, to 
people like I will do to anybody who's attended the seminar and say, hey, listen, if you want all, more information on the importance of going outside or the emotional side effects of screen time, I'll share something from the Surgeon General. I'll share something from uh, Myopia Boom article that I get. So they know we're developing a rapport. That's marketing. I think the key to success, see, everybody who attends this a workshop maybe thinks Dr. D has this trick, this ad, this letter, this advertising. And that doesn't, in my opinion, doesn't build a strong foundation. I've built a practice and I can teach how to build a practice by laying a great foundation, a great life. So I've learned there's a difference between myopia control and myopia management. And these are my definitions. You know, I'm one of the first doctors I feel that distinguishes between the two. So what is myopia control? Again, this is just me speaking. Myopia control is device, devices. It's treatments designed to slow down the progression of myopia. So the four that we all know of is atropine eye drops, which are not FDA approved yet. Uh, multifocal contacts, including contacts that are FDA approved and ones that are not multifocal soft. We have specialty glasses that are available outside the U.S. and soon hopefully will be available in the U.S. And of course, Ortho-K. But those are myopia control devices. What I have found that a patient, a family who's interested in managing their child's myopia is very different than my general population. And I use the analogy to teach this about the obesity epidemic, at least in my community, probably throughout the world, but at least in the United States, we have an epidemic of myopia among our youth. But it, just because the myopia or the obesity epidemic exists doesn't mean every parent is interested in doing something about it. And that doesn't mean they're a good parent or bad parent. And I found that with myopia. I sometimes tell a parent their child uh, has progressed in myopia full diopter. And the parent says, okay, give me a new prescription and I'll go to Costco or I'll go to uh, online and get a new prescription. Emotionally doesn't reflect any emotion at all. So other parents, I say, your child has progressed a quarter of diopter and the mother starts crying. So I know that mother is really a very good family, a candidate for myopia management. The one who says, okay, you know, they'll get LASIK when they're 25 or whatever, just give me their script, is not my demographic. And I think that's the first differentiate. Just because there's an epidemic of myopia doesn't mean every mom and dad is interested in doing something about it. So I concentrate on the demographic that's interested in myopia management, like the mother that started crying because their child increased a quarter of diopter in myopia management. So who are these? These are parents like myself. I'm an overachiever. I think I've, I've instilled this in my children. Uh, I'm a nervous parent. Uh, I'm an educated parent. I'm a guilty parent because I know both my children have developed myopia, not from genetics, but from my raising them and this drive for perfection, this drive to be the best, the drive to go to Ivy League, even from an early age. Luckily, I have my wife who tries to offset this, but the bottom line is I view myopia as a disease and I have tremendous guilt that I've caused this either genetically or environmentally. Maybe I'm letting them play uh, video games too much. So you get the trick. So I have found having a very big multidisciplinary practice, the, the referral sources for myopia management, for me, bar none, is friends and family. It's not Facebook. It's not funnel marketing. It's not YouTube. It's not me being an influencer, without a doubt. However, vision therapy, who we're very successful with, totally different. My partner, Barry Tannen, who runs our, our vision therapy office, gets them basically from OTs, MDs, ODs, PTs, teachers, OMDs, reading teachers. So he focuses on those referral sources. Yes, VT patients refer friends and family, but the way we've grown our vision therapy practice 
is through um, professional referrals, not friends and family. If I had, let's say, a scleral lens specialty contact lens practice, like many of you there, I'd focus on corneal specialists. I'd constantly show up at different corneal specialists, different ophthalmology office that have poor outcomes from LASIK surgery or some distorted or compromised corneas. And that's how I become successful in specialty lenses. I'd hit probably um, uh, all sorts of physicians that see patients with compromised corneas. And if I was, if I specialize in low vision, I would hit up the retinal specialists that really have these patients with compromised retinas that they don't know what to do with. So let's give a case study. This is a true email from a patient. Her mom is Teresa's, uh, Teresa's the patient. Hey, Dr. D, Teresa woke up today at midnight with pain. I get this all the time, especially in the beginning. After that, she has been hesitant. She has been hesitate and skips most nights. I'm concerned. Exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. I would like to bring her in ASAP exclamation mark. I look forward to hearing from you, Teresa's mom, intense mother here. So the way I've learned to grow my specialty care practice is to fulfill this mom's needs. And I'll explain to you what a need is. It's that I know that this is probably something child's learning, something stuck in between the lens and, and the eye, maybe something more ominous, but basically I need to get back to this mom ASAP. So she comes into my office and we reteach the INR. We get this child more adaptive to putting the lens in cleanly without some lint on it. And that night, swear to goodness, this is an email from the same mom that night. She says, hi, Dr. D. Thank you so much for spending time with Teresa this afternoon. Just remember the word time spending time. She put on the lenses at 9 p.m. because this kid was putting them in at 11 o'clock, going right to sleep. She was probably nine or 10 years old at the time, a tired as all heck. And that's why we developed this kind of crisis. And look what she said in the second paragraph. I referred my friend. They will email your staff for an appointment. This is very different than website optimization, funnel marketing, placing an ad in the newspaper, doing uh, Facebook uh, you know, videos and things like that. This is direct to parent marketing, which I view as great service. So this great service in our office, we, we refer to it as critical non-essentials or CNEs, C-N-E-S, CNEs. And we learned this from a, a dentist in Australia called Patty Lund. And basically he, he calls these critical, but they're non-essential to good patient care. They're critical to grow your office. They're critical to create an influencer mom to recommend people to your office. So they're not critical to a 21 point exam. They're not critical to great ortho K fit. But if you want to grow your practice and you're only focusing on critically fitting that ortho K lens or that soft multifocal lens or getting the right quantity of atropine to reduce axial length, you're not going to grow efficiently. You need to get good at creating an environment which creates raving fans. So a critical essential, not a non-essential, is basically... 21 point exam. That's critical. You don't do 21 point exam. It's malpractice, right? It's the tonometry. It's the, the, the refraction. It's ophthalmoscopy. We all are very good at that. I hope, but the critical non-essentials are what I did the minute I got this email because my emails, my text messages go to my front desk. So it's just like the phone. When we get one, they get response. And even after hours, I have developed systems to make sure these emails get answered immediately because of my clientele, my demographic. So I sent this email. Since Teresa is experiencing fear, I'd like to examine her ASAP. So I used the word ASAP or the, uh, the abbreviation ASAP because she used it. So I put an asterisk there. I didn't do it for the patient, I did it for you. I've copied my staff 
who will get Teresa in ASAP, number two ASAP. I give her a note for school. So why did I add this? Because I know from doing this for so many decades, people want to come in after school, after soccer, after music lessons, after gymnastics. I leave my office at five o'clock. So I found I kind of preempt this by saying, I'm going to give them a note for school. And I said to her, this is the kicker. And we're going to talk about why I do this. Thanks for the excellent update. I'm thanking her for updating me on what's going on. So the reason I do this, and I didn't use the term when I used to lecture before the pandemic, but I worked hard during the pandemic because I couldn't get out there in person to lecture. I, and during the pandemic, all of a sudden, my schedule was thinned out. I'm in the parking lot talking to patients because I don't want them to come in. And I'm talking to them at their car, just like they're their friend. And I notice all of a sudden, the people I'm spending time with, the parents, they're becoming influencers, not Instagram influence. Maybe it's WeChat influencers. Maybe it's Facebook influence. Maybe they're talking to their friends and family on the, on the, in the church or in the soccer field. I don't know. And I don't know which mom or dad is an influencer, but I know every mom or dad has the potential for being an influencer. This is not taught. You know, all of us want something easy. Myopia management's not easy. Even if I gave you an ad that got your phone to ring, or I got all these people to funnel into your practice, if you don't know how to take care of those patients, you're spinning your wheels. You're working harder. You've taken on myopia management to have more profitability, more income, more professional gratification, and you've made yourself miserable unless you learn how to kind of work upon those opportunities so they refer more friends and family. Otherwise, what you're doing is you're fitting more and more patients and giving yourself more and more hard work that doesn't realize or yield referrals. You have to make, how are you going to make your, your parents so happy with you, they become raving fans? And here's another hint. The first hint I gave you is if you squeeze patients in between your checks, you're done. You're better off just referring out, whatever your case may be. Number two is it's not correcting vision. If you think creating a social influencer means you need to get the kid to see 2020 OD slash OS and their axial length is stable, it's not enough. That's why the parents come to me. It's like I say to I my practice has grown because I'm the best refractionist and everybody sees so incredibly well out of my glasses. Well, that's why they came to see me. It's not enough. So my opinion is, is that you really need to understand how to create a social influencer to build a practice with legs, with a strong foundation. So these are my critical non-essentials. You know, I email and text patients with urgency. It's not even enough that you give a patient your cell phone, which I'm not saying you should do, but if you're not getting back to them, it's just almost like they feel you're ghosting them. So it's not even enough that you give them access to your office more than just, you know, leaving a message on the patient portal and waiting for someone to get back you need to get back to them with urgency, you know, and we need to spend time. You know, I just heard a podcast with Fesh, Bethany Fishbain. Uh, she's the power practice CEO, and she does a weekly uh, podcast. I have no affiliation with pod, uh, power practice other than being a client at one time and really a fan of them. And they were interviewing um, Tan Mai, Dr. Tan Mai. And he is part of Treehouse, has very successful practice in California. And he said something about The Purple Cow, a book by Seth Godin. And I never heard of that book, I'm embarrassed to say. But I understood what a purple cow was. I hope I'm getting the title right. And he said in this interview, and I urge you to listen, it, was, it, just, it just aired within the past few months, is the purple cow that he refers to is how he spends time with the patient. And for me, the critical non-essential is to spend time with my patients. It's that easy and that difficult. 
that's what gets the word of mouth. It's not this magic ad. It's not making the, the child comfortable with ortho K lenses, seeing well and their axial growth stable. It's time. And we follow up on every visit and we'll go over that. And we have dedicated staff for all myopia patients. You know, so when we get a phone call and we don't have maybe 5, 10, 25, 55 minutes to spend, it goes directly to a dedicated staff. It wasn't always like that, but I've created systems. So here's a very recent email on the upper right-hand corner. It came in in June and it symbolizes to you, it represents the extent I go through to grow my practice and charge the fees that I charge that we're going to discuss next week. This is from the patient. I'm going to guess she's probably 14, maybe 16, but she copies her parent, both parents. Yes, Dr. D, my, my new lens, my new lenses are perfect. Thank you for checking in. So number one, I initiated this. I said, how are your new lenses working out? This is being proactive. I don't order a new lens. I don't know if this is a duplicate. I don't know if I modify the lenses, to be honest with you. But it doesn't matter because we check up on everyone because I want to be proactive. I don't want to hear, hey, Dr. D, the new lenses don't work as well as my previous pair, which I get all the time. I do this every day, guys. I have no reason to lie to you. It happens to me all the time. I create a new design, new pair of lenses, and the patient says to me, they're not working as well. So I'm proactive. Also, so that was, I, I would say that's a critical non-essential, but this is what I call a super senior, super critical non-essential. During the checkup, she told me they got a new dog named Duke, and they're so excited that the mother and the father and the child are showing me pictures of Duke. This is a corneal reshaping checkup. So I, what I did is I had my staff, we have a system, and this is how I teach a system, is basically to make a note and say, listen, write a little card and send them a $10 PetSmart gift card. So she says, also, thank you so much for the PetSmart gift card for our dog, Duke. We will use it to buy him a celebratory three-month-old toy. You are the best. So why is this so important to create an influence? The influence is not going to go go to Dr. D and Dr. Lee and Dr. Noah because they get you Petco gift cards. They know I've gone out of my way to be more than just an eye doctor. And that's how you create a specialty care practice with legs. This is how you create a lifestyle. It's, it's you know, it's, I don't enjoy necessarily fitting ortho K lenses, although 99% of my practice is fitting children with an RGP lens. What I enjoy is the appreciation, the respect I get, the loyalty I get. Remember that? So during the consult, I even market, and we'll go through this in the third part of this series in detail, what I do in a consultation, but I spend one hour and I don't do it during the time of the exam. What do I do? I educate them before the consultation, during the consultation and afterwards, and I give snacks and snacks, if you know me and leverage is huge. And so many ODs that I teach, say, ah, Dr. D, I offer it. I pull up the draw and they don't take them. Well, it's because your snacks are either anemic or your delivery is anemic. It's not strong. Like me, I give 40-year-old snacks because they've been my patients since they're 20. And I say, and they say, Dr. D, thank you. And that's not the snack. It's that I care enough to open the drawer and say, I know you're 20 years old. I know you're 40 years old and you're a physician, but take a snack. And then they start bringing me in their children. So you could see how my practice has a strong foundation Despite what all the noise we started talking about this in the beginning of the workshop, it doesn't matter. I have a business with legs. I have a business with substance. It doesn't mean every day is Disney World in my office. It doesn't mean my practice grows every week for the past 35 years. No, it means I'm not affected by all the noise, that, that FOMO that we talked about initially. I email my patients before the consult and after the consult, and I give reports. So what do I email them? And we're going to elaborate this on the third part of this series is, dear Mr. and Mrs. Jones, it was a pleasure to evaluate Teresa. She will do very well with our program. 
I've attached two papers based on our discussion. So a lot of times during the consult, they'll say, they'll ask me about side effects or how do I know the child is stabilized if they wear the lens. Sometimes they ask me about daylight or screen time and I send them some papers. And I said, I've provided you with a lot of information. Please look it over and feel free to email me any questions. So this is the parent's response. Thank you for the consultation and providing all the information. I read online and understand there are two types of FDA approved OK lenses. This was a while ago. Teresa has been a patient of mine for over 10 years, I think about 12 years. And at the time there was only CRT and VST. Now there's obviously ability in J&J. &J. Thank you for your time. So you could see my chair cost is going up, right? How much time I'm spending with this patient was not only during the consultation is answering the questions. So I've learned after my consultation, I give a report to the parent. It's a, in a nice folder, just like when you buy some jewelry or buy a car or buy anything of value, you sign out your child up for preschool or private school, you get a nice folder with information. And it's not the, I, I don't think it's the content as much as the presentation. And I also copy anybody involved. So if an OD is referred this patient to my office, they get a copy of the report as well. And people say ODs don't refer. I don't, I don't know. I think ODs, MDs, they're busy. It takes a lot of work. It's not just like, hey, you're progressing in myopia. You should go see this doctor there. It takes a lot of work to educate what myopia management is. So you got to return that effort by rewarding them, by keeping that OD or whomever is referring to you in the loop. I really want to shout out Kate Gifford and her husband. They've done an amazing job in the field of myopia management, not just this past year, I mean, over the long haul. So I share their myopia profile um, a website with parents. I include some of their uh, danger zones and what makes the child more at risk than others. So I strongly recommend not only do you become part of Kate Gifford's group and get educated through that group. And again, I have no vested interest. I've never even met Kate and her husband personally, but I've benefited a lot for their hard work. So in the report, I'll put my history that I take. It was a pleasure seeing her. She's 10 years old. She's in the fifth grade. I give their refraction and their eyeglasses so you could see they've progressed from 350 to 450. I put in a graph that I may get from myopia profile from some other source and say, listen, if you don't do something, they statistically will end up maybe minus eight when they're 24 years old. So again, the report educates and it looks nice. And then you're going to have to decide, and we'll talk about this in detail next week when we talk about fee development and the week after with how do you train your technician to, pre to present fees or sometimes doctors present fees. But here's what I want you to get today. It's counterintuitive. The more the doctor charges, the more successful they'll be. It's counter to you think, well, if I'm the least expensive, then I'll be the busiest and I will be the the, the most successful myopia management doctor. My experience has been doing this again for over two decades. The opposite is true. So we keep communicating. Teresa's mom deciding to sign up finally. Thank you again for answering all my questions. The price quoted was X. We weren't expecting it to be that much. Is it negotiable? I get this a lot. The cultures who are interested in myopia management seem to really want to make sure they get the best price that I'm offering, not the best price out there. They just want to know what the price that their daughter is getting is the price the next person is getting. A friend mentioned CRT lens for their son. Is this the same lens you're using? So I have found this to increase exponentially. Patients are more and more educated on myopia management. When I started this, the questions were, why don't other doctors do that? Now, I would say at least 50% of the pediatric patients I see in my patients enter on atropine already. And we'll talk about that again next week and the week after. So now your chair cost is increasing. And if you don't spend the time to answer these questions, you're just got on a dangerous treadmill. You may get busy, especially if you're inexpensive, but you're not going to be happy. So to summarize this talk, this is a very high level concept. So when I said 
I started talking to my local optometric society this past week, which spurred this online discussion with you and giving you COPE credit is they were looking at me like I had two heads, like I was speaking Greek. They don't understand needs and wants. And I found when I lecture at Vision by Design, I lecture to sometimes 200, 500 people. Everybody's looking at me. They understand this concept I'm about to introduce, patient wants and patient needs. So what are patient wants is what most of us just focus upon. They're coming to us for clear vision, myopia control, and they want to be seen on time. That's their conscious wants. I want to be seen on time. I want you to control my child's myopia. I want them to see well. But what are their needs? They don't tell you what their needs are. I want you, Dr. D, I want you, Dr. Jones, to get me over this guilt that my child has progressed so much in myopia, they can't see the big E. I want you to get over the guilt that I've always been a minus 10, minus six, minus three, and now my child is a minus three. I want help, Dr. D. I want advocacy. I want help getting my kid off the iPad. I want to know, is the iPad, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, bad for their eyes? And also, I notice my child is up later and later sleeping. Is that good? Because the competition is great. I have made time, and you need to make time to address patient needs. That's the key to marketing. It's not a trick ad. It's not a letter. It's not an advertisement. It's not a billboard. It's making the time to understand what are your patients' needs? What do they need from you? It's not what do they want from you. So for example, people come for glasses. They want to see good out of their glasses. They want to look good out of their glasses. And they want the glasses to feel good. That's their want, right? Their need is, I want to talk to you. I want to tell you about my grandchildren, maybe. I want to talk to you about my dogs, like that patient did about Duke, her dog. I want to make sure I don't have macular degeneration that my grandmother lost her vision from, but they don't tell us, right? They wanna know they're not gonna get glaucoma like a family member or a colleague. So you see the difference between needs and wants? So uh, we're running out of time. So I have so much to go over next week, but I wanna give a few examples of needs and wants. When walking into your office, this is from a parent, is this good marketing or good care? I, when walking into your office for the first time, I was uncertain, feeling hopeless, their vision was getting worse. So this parent in this email has told me what her need was. Your warm greeting, professional explanation, confidence in the results. We are grateful for your guidance throughout this journey. They've been in this program a long time. See, this is critical non-essential greeting them professionally, spending time at every visit, you can see that this is much more than correcting the vision. It's hard for me to express my feelings into words. You're not only provide us with medical treatment, but also a role model as a doctor. That's a need. She didn't come into the consult saying, I need you to be a role model for myself and my children. I need you to treat me with respect and spend time with me. This mom is an influencer. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. But she has referred dozens of patients to me through the years. All it took was spending time, maybe some lectures, things of that nature. So to wrap up, let's give an example. Your level of success in any specialty care will parallel your level of commitment to myopia management vision therapy. So this is emails. It's like typical email I get with a new patient, okay? The email is on 6-4, Sunday morning, both eyes, she struggled to get them in. This is a recent INR. The next day, good vision, but blurry in the afternoon. This is the next day, 6-5, the same day, p.m., not able to put the lenses in, the right eye was easy. So look what I did. I jumped in there. I was corresponding with her with 6465. It's only been two damn days. And I set up a virtual meeting with my tech to go over the INR process. 6 6 that evening, she emails me late. Both lenses in quickly, five minutes. 6 7, good vision, better than Monday. Look at that. 
this. It's Wednesday. This all, the party started Monday. But in the parents' eyes, this, I addressed her needs. Her needs is, I need you to help me because I'm scared to death my child may hurt themselves. So to summarize, this is an example, a testimonial for Teresa's mom, but it's a decade later. Teresa has been cared for by Dr. D for 12 years. She started to wear glasses in the first grade. We were recommended to Dr. D by many friends. And that I hear a lot. It's not one friend. Like some of you ask me, should I spiff? Should I like reward the person who refer him? Absolutely not. They're referring to you because of the care you provide. He's different from normal doctors who give patients a few minutes per visit. I'm different than you. The only difference is, let's use that purple cow analogy, is that I spend time with that patient, which makes me different. Dr. D communicates via email and phone. That is a purple cow, even today. I wish I wrote this letter sooner. So clearly, that marketing is synonymous with good care. And you just have to trust me. I'm not, I'm, I have no reason to lie to you. So why focus on one road? One Remember one, one, one road, not the walls that Mario Andretti was talking about? A good doctor treats us, no doubt. A great doctor makes us feel better. We value the great doctor's ability to do both. And I went into this profession to do both. I'm built that way. When I was accepting more and more insurances, my ability to spend time with patients was becoming compromised. And next week, I promise you, I will take you step to step how to develop fees that make sense for your office. So thank you. So this, it's about 50, I don't know how many minutes into it. We're about 51 minutes. What I'd like you to do is Megan, the executive director of the Academy, you can instant message her questions. I'll answer them probably starting the next talk. So we, we, we get on with our Sunday, but I do want to, to help promote since it's the end of the CE on vision by design. I would not be where I am today. If I didn't start attending the equivalent of vision by design in 2000, I knew about myopia management. I was dabbling in it, but when Kerry Herzberg and his team came up with this vision by design. I learned so much, not only about fitting ortho K lenses and myopia management, I learned from speaking to colleagues. Remember, I started this talk by saying, I go to my CE, they know me. This is my New Jersey Optometric Association. I have about 60 to 100 people in the audience and they're not getting it. And that's okay, they're there for CE. But when you go to Vision by Design, everybody has made a commitment on myopia management. This, remember I just talked about the joy of missing out? They're in there by themselves. They picked out myopia management. They're there to find more. So I learned as much, you've heard me say this before, if you listen to me, in the hallways as I've done in the lecture halls. I can't tell you if you've gone to different optometric lectures, like say the AOA symposium and the Academy symposium, which I go to all the time, and even the global contact lens specialty symposium, they all have different vibes. The reason I've never missed a vision by design meeting is because I benefit even learning one thing every time I come home. I also give a workshop. You know, why give this lecture is because, of course, I give this workshop called Supercharge Your Practice. It's one tuition, one day, and a lifetime of change. And through the years, it's gone from a few hours to a full day. And I've really refined the workshop where I give people not only the tools, they establish the tools right at the webinar or at the seminar rather. So at the workshop, they're leaving with goals because what I found what was lacking five years ago is that they were pumped up and they had all the tools, but they didn't have the plan, the template in place. So when they went back to their office, they're like, oh my God, I don't even know where to start. No, you know exactly where to start. So the workshop is $4,000 and you now get a $300 discount if you sign up before the 31st of July. And you'll say, wow, that's a lot of money. It, no doubt. But that is the value of the workshop. Because when you leave, 
you not only set your goals of how many console spots, how much am I going to charge? How many, uh, um, what is my maintenance plan? What is my recall, which no one talks about? You're going to prioritize them A, B, C, D maybe. And you're going to throw away the Cs and you're just going to co correspond on the As. And even though it's a one-time fee, everybody, everybody who's gone to supercharge over the past 15 years will tell you Nick is available. I do this because I love the feeling I get, the buzz I get, when I give supercharge and I only do it once a year and I only do it at vision by design today. I've given you a strong background for marketing, but then I give the tools and explain in detail how to market in office and out of office. And I talk about things like Facebook and WeChat in detail. Then I really start expanding. How do you deliver this? So, okay, Nick, you're emailing your patients, you're texting your patients. I get it. You're giving them reports, but damn it, I don't have time to breathe. Well, I go through step by step how you deliver consistent, repeatable care to your patients so their experience is repeatable. The one thing of growing a practice the way I have, it's very fragile. It's all customer service based. Sometimes it takes just one bad experience and it sours that influencer to refer friends and family. So I've had, I know I'm going to let people down. So I've created systems for even when I let them down, how do I fulfill that? So when you look at my um, website or my Googles, I only have a few reviews. I, I don't ask for reviews. I'm not into having 500 reviews to bury the bad ones. I make sure that all 30, whatever reviews I have on Google or Yelp are positive. And if they're not, I pick up the phone and call the patient. I'm sorry I left you down. That's why they're positive reviews. It's not that I'm perfect. Nobody is perfect. Somehow we go to these lectures and people have an arterial motive. I'm there to help you. I'm helping you get out of your own way, if you will. I talk about leadership to nauseam because we're good optometrists but that has no bearing if you're gonna be a good leader. And I help you design your org chart where you're there. I help you design a plan of action when you leave. And I really do feel hiring. I've been very blessed before, during, and after the pandemic. It's not because I have this great system and things like that. I get how to hire, I get when to fire, and I know how to retain and train good staff. It even includes drug testing and things like that. So when you leave there, not only do you have a wealth of knowledge and binders and books and manuals and forms, you have a plan. And the plan I am telling you is not my plan because we spend over an hour, just think it's one day, all immersion for yourself where you're writing down what do you value most in life? Why should you grow a specialty care practice? Why did you develop a private practice in the meantime? So I make sure there's lasting change. So this is a diagram from um, the Atomic Habits author. And what he is so big on promoting is that there's a valley of disappointment. Even today, it's Sunday somewhere. And you guys are pumped up. And then you'll turn it off and you'll say, wow. I'm hoping you say that was inspiring. That was pretty good. The thing is, by Monday, the sugar is going to hit the fan. Someone's going to quit. A patient's going to complain. Something's going to happen. And you get this valley of disappointment. And all this was to you was maybe one CE credit. I make sure when you leave that you have a clear point of action. Every testimonial that I that I that people leave with, every testimonial that people leave with is because I follow up. I make sure everybody there is a leader, that they're doing it on their own. Whether you hire a consultant, where you decide to take on uh, something that does the marketing for you and runs your practice, the consultant, uh, whatever you decide to do, you need to still lead yourself. There's no ad, there's no consultant, there's no franchise or licensing that's going to drive you. It's got to be inside of you. Why do I build a practice that gives me a beautiful life? There's no consultant, there's no licensing, there's no program you buy that will do that. There's no masterclass, it's all you. 
So when I get, you know, if you go to www.superchargerpractice.com, you'll see sincere testimonials is how powerful the workshop is because they feel how much I want everybody to attend to succeed. So you, this is my website, Supercharge Your Practice. I thank you very much for giving me your time this Sunday morning. Some of you have gotten up as early as 6.30. I hope I haven't let you down. I'll take your questions. I'll formulate them into next week's talk, and then we'll keep going that way. You guys take doctor's orders. Enjoy your weekend.